Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Patricio Davila, and I'm the curator of this exhibition. I'm trying to get away from the speaker just so that we don't get like major feedback. <laughs> um, I wanted to start off with um, acknowledging the territory uh, that we're on, that this exhibition is on. I think it's uh, particularly uh, important to acknowledge that this is the traditional uh, territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of New Credit, and Métis, amongst um, other um, indigenous groups uh, from this area. It's particularly um, important for me to reflect on that, uh, given the content of this exhibition. This exhibition um, features uh, a few indigenous cartographers and artists who use maps to counter dominant narratives of um, settler colonialism, of white supremacy. And um, when we do these land acknowledgements, it's, it's important to kind of link um, what we're doing in that particular time and space right now with this um, trajectory that we are, whether we're indigenous, immigrants, settlers, um, we're benefiting from. So I want to do that with uh, Peter, uh, Peter Hall, who uh, I've known over maybe two, three years, maybe longer. Maybe longer. Um, I've known him for, uh, through Reputation First, uh, several volumes that he wrote on uh, graphic designers um, and on mapping uh, elsewhere. Uh, mapping was a book that uh, uh, was quite influential for me. That was about 10 years ago. Um, he's come to give us a talk on measurement and being which I'm really looking forward to. Um, very, I'm looking forward to it because it's also a chapter that he's gonna be writing in a book that we're both co-authoring. So I'm really looking forward to see what he's writing, <laughs> gonna be writing about, so that maybe I don't write about it or that I can give him some good critique. <laughs> to prove that I'm actually working. <laughs> that's, that's right. So uh, we're really pleased that uh, you could join us today. Oh, we're going to go for about, I think, in 45 minutes, an hour. Yeah. And then afterwards, um, there's going to be ample time for back and forth. And I'm hoping that people will feel comfortable with uh, coming back with uh, critique, uh, with, uh, with comments. I'm going to be taking some notes just to keep things going. Uh, but you'll be able to jump in. We're also recording this uh, so that uh, someone can see it offline, um, or online, I should say. And uh, there was a huge um, wait list to come to this, so it'll be up for people who couldn't attend. Thanks, Patricio. I think I might stand up because I feel a bit weird talking to you since I'm down. And uh, then I'll be able to see people in the back row if I stand up. So I'll try that. Um, uh, thanks also to OCAD for um, having me over. Um, this, oh, and congratulations, Patricia, for this show. It's specifically why I came over, because I wanted to see diagrams of power. And um, uh, my talk is kind of tangentially related. Um, in, in the, the show turns the tools of mapping and visualization toward um, making things visible, um, or as Patricia puts it, inconvenient stories that upset and resist the status quo. Um, but uh, to do this, turn the tools of visualization and mapping against the status quo, I think requires a recognition that every tool has a cultural history and a way of imagining our in the world. And that odds with the uh, being in the world of the people we're, whose interests to represent. Um, so I'm not going to in uh, particular, but I'm uh, the element of that is, is how we make things. Um, and that the has a cultural history in its And I want to just ask how to unpick and reimagine a very Western sense of self that's reinforced by uh, the measurements we make, visualizations we produce. So that's really um, theme. Um, so I was uh, in the present and then going uh, So, or recent, recent history, the quantified self. Um, I'm particularly interested, this will be uh, the, a chapter in the book. Um, so the sociologist who wrote this book, um, oh yeah, oh is the battery running?
Yeah. Okay. Um, so Deborah Lupton's written this book on um, this practice of quantifying one's life with the aid of tracking technologies like heart rate monitors and smart watches, Fitbits, smartphones. And um, uh, this is a, a line in the book. So uh, digital data generate new forms of knowledge and new insights into people's bodies and selves. And that's uh, a face value, the whole ethos of the quantified self movement. Um, quantified self website was set up by Gary Wolf. There's a TED talk by him on it. Uh, Kevin Kelly set it up with him. Uh, Kevin Kelly of Wired magazine. And um, on that site, you see uh, things like uh, Tiffany Chi's college performance. Um, so it's user community worldwide um, uh, uh, is served by the site. Uh, it produces international meetings, conferences, and expos, community fora, uh, web content and services, and a guide to self-tracking tools. And then um, uh, people sort of upload their daily data to the site. And the idea is that by sharing the uh, data, you arrive at new insights. Um, and Kevin Kelly's version of measuring, tracking, and quantifying the self is underlined by very utopian kind of belief. Uh, it sort of suggests that the body self is a kind of a machine uh, or machine-like entity with inputs and outputs. And, uh, and he even uses the line, um, unless something can be measured, it cannot be improved. Um, Tiffany Chi's project is a good example of that belief system in action. So um, in the four years of undergraduate study, she tracked her time organizing and color coding it, as you see here, into categories like exercise, class, games, slash time wasting. Uh, it's interesting that games are seen as time wasting. Um, homework and studies, and then analyzing the data with questions like, um, uh, did her commitment to her studies wane over time? Uh, how much um, did time spent studying matter for her final grade? Did the amount of time spent on fun help or hinder her grades? And did having a job uh, or job-like responsibilities lower her grades? So um, useful insights, I guess. Um, and then we uh, jump to a very familiar um, example of um, the graphic designer Nicholas Felton who took up the practice of life tracking in 2005 um, with his personal annual reports. And these were named for an imaginary organization called Feltron. And um, they appear to parody the aesthetic of administration, which is a, um, a phrase that the art critic Benjamin Buclo used in 1990. That's a particularly useful one, because the aesthetic of administration is kind of all around us now in the, in the quantification and visualization of self. Um, and uh, so he uses the corporate and visual language, uh, sorry, the textual language of the corporate annual report um, while conveying elements of um, the modern day live streamers, narcissism. Uh, narcissism meant in the sense of, you know, inward looking. Um, so this one, the 2005 report quantifies in statistical charts everything from the kinds of meals he ate, the miles he ran, how many emails and texts he sent, which books he's read, uh, photographs taken per country visit, uh, amount of time spent at work and play. And then there's one every year uh, after that. So the 2008 one, for example, conveys everything in distances so that uh, the year can be expressed as a single individual number. Um, in Felton's case, 38,524 miles. And that included uh, um, miles flown, driven, walked, swam, run alongside those who traveled in the video game Grand Theft Auto. Um, <laughs> and over eight years of doing these um, annual reports, uh, Felton informs us that um, in his worn, noisy pedometers that clicked every time he took a step, he's built his own iPhone app to bug him through the day to ask what he was up to. Um, he spent a year documenting every single conversation he had, and even at one point found himself weighing a three-year-old's birthday cake to track his eating habits. Um, so <clears throat> Michael Johnson, uh, the London-based graphic designer, has uh, written in one of the uh, kind of design magazines a critique of uh, Felton's annual report as a classic example of what he calls Me Too projects, functioning, functioning as a sort of typographic Truman show, as he puts it, but ultimately serving only to promote 
Felton's design practice. I'm thinking about this. Um, I thought that's actually not the critique I'm looking for. It's not quite right. It's more of a I don't like it kind of critique um, by, by, by sort of dismissing the whole um, quantification of self as trendy or ephemeral. It's a bit like, you know, uh, saying I just don't like it. Uh, it's, it's just saying, oh, it's not going to last. It's just a fad. Um, but I do think it's important to have a, in, in embark on a critique of the quantified self. Um, so that's really my question. Uh, how might we better critique this kind of visualization phenomenon? Um, and our first guide might be to interrogate the visualizations themselves and ask what, what they're seeking to make visible. Um, Felton responded to that question and said in an interview that tracking and measuring his life had provided unexpected insights. Uh, he said, the reports once inspired me to be more adventurous and say yes to activities that I would naturally decline, as it might make for an interesting story at the end of the year. But now uh, that they've become so ingrained in my behavior, I'm far less likely to be swayed by their influence. In general, I think the reports have made me a much more aware person, much more aware of my routines and grateful when I can break from them. Um, so uh, the final annual report, 2014, before he gave it up, used all off-the-shelf tracking methods. So that by this point, um, smartphones, Fitbits, um, heart rate monitors were available, whereas before he was doing it kind of more manually. Um, so in a sense, he uh, anticipated the, uh, the trend. Um, but uh, to back to uh, Michael Johnson's critique that it's just a fad, um, or it's a kind of narcissism in the service of self-promotion, um, I, I think that flies in the face of the, the fact that it's kind of all around us. Um, I do it. I use Strava. I don't know who uses Strava. But I can't help it, but I want to track every time I run. Um, so I'm not suggesting that I'm somehow above all these people, um, but I am interested in, 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 the, in a critique. So how might we critique this form of visualization and this kind of practice? So um, uh, the book that... Um, Patricio mentioned we're, we're just beginning, so I'm trying out this chapter on you, really. Um, and uh, one useful um, <laughs> first person to pop into the picture is uh, Foucault and his definition of critique. Um, so uh, our, um, I guess our premise is uh, beginning with, uh, or at least we pitched the book uh, as a dissatisfaction with the sort of golly gee approach to uh, information visualization, the sort of information is beautiful, uh, to quote the, the, the David McCandless book, approach to visualization where I said, wow, it's so complex, it's so colorful, uh, it's, it's so um, representative of the complexity of modern life. So to sort of get beyond that, uh, at least accompany that fetishism with something hopefully a bit more substantive. But um, critique isn't easy, um, and uh, it's a project. And um, I think our, our starting point is to say that data are never neutral, um, and the data are always gathered at a certain time in a certain place for a certain reason. And um, how data are conceived, measured, and employed actively frames their nature, as the quote uh, um, two critics on, this, on the topic, um, Kitchen and Lurio. Um, but uh, uh, we're looking at... Uh, um, establishing and making explicit in the book a framework for critique, um, a critique of visualization. And um, in a 1981 interview on French politics, Foucault presented a definition of critique that I find very, very useful because the first thing he says is it's not about saying it's good or bad, or I like it, or I don't like it, or it's just a fad, or it's not a fad, it's going to last forever. Because those things are kind of opinions um, that aren't that useful. A critique, he says, consists in seeing on what type of assumptions, familiar notions, established, unexamined ways of thinking the accepted practices are based. So whenever you hear that word normative, that's this kind of Foucauldian thinking, as it were, where we're exploring what has become normative, what's become the norm, and then asking, what is that uh, based on? I think that's a, a, a very useful way forward. So. Um, Foucault also introduced the notion of the di dispositif, uh, which can be aligned with what uh, Kitchen and Lurio, who I quoted earlier, call the data assemblage. Um, they describe the data assemblage as a complex socio-technical system composed of many apparatuses and elements that are thoroughly entwined 
whose central concern is the production of a data. A data assemblage consists of more than the data system or infrastructure itself, um, such as a big data system. Uh, so it's a big data system, an open data repository or a data archive. It includes all of, the, all of that and the technological, political, social, and economic apparatuses that frame um, the nature and operation of the work. So a uh, complicated quote for um, a dispositive or a data assemblage, but in other words, they're talking about it's more than just the data. It's more than the neutral data. It's more than just the visualization. It's the whole set of assumptions, the unexamined ways of thinking, and all of the infrastructures that go into the production of that data. Um, so uh, then the question is how to um, turn the dispositive or the data assemblage into something could be used as a framework for interrogating visualization. So uh, my background's journalism. I can't help but do lists, bullet points. Uh, that's always how I wrote a story. I do a list of how the story's going to work out. Um, and journalism sort of fundamentally starts with, well, who, what, why, when, how? Uh, who did it? Why did they? When was it done? How was it done? So um, that's uh, um, so familiar to me, hopefully to you too, that I'm kind of bored with it. And I also think it's not quite right. Um, with visualization or data assemblages or dispositif, I think it can be expanded a little bit more. So when we see a visualization, then we can ask, and this is a working bullet point list, working framework, who made it? When did they make it? Why did they make it? How was it made? Like what materials, what technologies, what infrastructures were they using? in what social cultural conditions, so what assumptions and examined ways of thinking are at work, what was causing it to be made, uh, what, is trying to, what is it trying to make visible, like what is its story, what story is it trying to tell, and then uh, this is the key, what dominant belief systems is it reinforcing or challenging? So a lot of visualization, data visualization, is simply reinforcing a belief system. Um, and uh, the belief system might be uh, that network is really big and complicated, or um, uh, that uh, country makes a lot of GDP, um, or there's a big gap between uh, rich and poor, um, or in the case of the quantified self, uh, you've got to me measure yourself to improve yourself, and I'll come back to that. But the idea that a dominant uh, visualization can also challenge a dominant belief system is obviously at work all around us in this exhibition. And uh, that's kind of a, an interesting um, pairing uh, for us to go forward with the uh, book because a critical visualization um, can be uh, a critique of visualization. So you could use these tools to critique dominant visualizations. But if your visualization itself is challenging something, a dominant belief system, then it is a uh, our definition uh, may be a critical visualization. Um, so that's our sort of, uh, or at my, uh, I haven't really uh, tested it on Patricia, he hasn't told me if he hates it yet, uh, a, a working framework. Um, and the advocates of uh, the quantified self movement argue that using technology to measure something in your life and sharing that information with other people reveals wider causalities and correlations. But as with a lot of uh, behavioral approaches, there's a reluctance following that statement to then interrogate those causalities and do what Foucault's asking us to do, ask what unexamined ways of thinking are being taken as normal. Um, and here's a good cue to bring in the great Canadian Marshall McLuhan, um, uh, who's always credited at least for this quote, although apparently it was Father John Corkin um, who came up with it, they were friends. Uh, we become what we behold, we shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. Um, so in a BBC documentary on the popularization of quantified self and the emergence of smart technologies um, to support quantification of the self, a psychoanalyst questions the practice of what he calls subcontracting the monitoring process uh, to devices whereby your happiness, your well-being, then becomes dependent not on your own awareness of um, well, am I happy, am I feeling good, uh, but on proxy devices. So um, uh, it's a bit like um, what's the weather like? Instead of going outside to see the weather, you check your phone. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's in a sense, that's the way our tools of 
started to shape us. Um, but um, Cohen then tends to cling to a rather unchallenged notion of the authentic self-aware self. Um, but we know from thinkers since McLuhan and uh, uh, the Reverend Culkin uh, that what we call human um, is not a raw or pure concept, but one in constant flux. So as we invent a new technology, it then goes on to change us, invent us. Um, so we develop and evolve in response to our inventions. A uh, classic example being the introduction of train travel uh, was accompanied by the reporting in the newspapers of illnesses uh, in response to train travel. It was thought that people couldn't cope with the fast movement of the landscape uh, outside the train windows. So all sorts of ailments, so, so nausea, sickness, dizziness, um, sort of train sickness emerged. And we never hear of uh, train sickness now, but that was uh, what accompanied the emergence of train travel. And in theory, we've then adapted to train travel so that we can cope with the speed of the landscape flying by. Um, <clears throat> so back to the quantified self movement. And here Lupton gets a bit more critical. Um, what belief systems are being perpetuated by this idea of my measuring ourselves in is a way of improving ourselves. Um, she uh, finds in the literature this prevailing notion um, of individuals as atomized actors who are expected and encouraged to work on themselves in the quest to achieve health, productivity, and happiness. Um, and in this literature, it's typically contended that you should have uh, a relationship with yourself that involves an ethical responsibility to achieve uh, this this better self. Um, and that relationship involves delving beneath the surface in order to uncover the hidden desires, drives, and motivations that the psyche harbors. Um, and uh, as she puts it here, uh, underlying it all are the unexamined notions, ways of thinking, are these individualistic practices of selfhood. They promote the concept of the citizen who needs no coercion to behave productively and, as she puts it, in the interests of the state. Because the state is not interested in us becoming uh, ill, um, mentally ill, uh, um, degenerates, um, criminals. Uh, sorry, I'm using these terms rather provocatively because I'll get to this later, um, this sort of normalization of well-behaved citizens. Um, so uh, it is, she argues, in the interests of the state to have us constantly measuring and believing in improvement of ourselves as atomized individuals. Um, so uh, there's three kind of um, key metaphors, in a way, uh, at work in the quantified self-movement. One is the, um, the body as a machine. That comes up again and again and again. We measure the machine, we improve what we put in the machine, better things come out of the machine, better performance. Um, second is uh, um, that if you don't overcome your, in your own difficulties, that's your fault. It's the fault of the private individual rather than of their, your relative social and economic advantage. And the third point um, she makes is this, is this idea, the metaphor of the spectacularized or the visualized body. So um, let's, with this holy trio, health, productivity, and happiness that are being um, uh, mythologized in the quantified self. Let's go back then in time um, and see how, uh, um, where, where this all comes from. Pro productivity is my main focus here, um, particularly because of its connection to the visualization of time um, and the recent emergence of a, a counterculture of slow living, I think, has helped uh, sort of sharpen the focus on this idea of our concept of time and how we measure it because it's given voice to a populist critique of the entanglement of productivity and the visual measurement of time. Uh, Lewis Mumford, the uh, critic, uh, called the clock the key machine of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and uh, there's a fantastic essay written in 1967 uh, by E.P. Thompson, the historian, uh, called uh, Time, Work, Discipline, and Industrial Capitalism. And uh, this is a very uh, beautiful, vivid account of how the clock, the pocket watch, and a puritanical kind of abhorrence of sloth uh, combined to achieve the widespread internalization of time discipline. That's his phrase, time discipline. So 
um, as, as these uh, contraptions began to appear that visually measured time, um, they began to shape us. We invented the machine, it shaped us. Uh, uh, people started to behave in a certain way in response to this invention. Um, so there's the division of labor, the supervision of labor. There were fines, bells and clocks, money incentives for, you know, following, uh, you know, for good timekeeping. Uh, there were preachings, uh, like the puritanical side of it. Being on time is good, um, morally good. Uh, there were school lessons. Um, there was a wide suppression of things like fairs and sports. Uh, new labor habits were formed. Um, this is what the essay does. Uh, it tracks how this emerged over, um, focusing mainly on the UK, uh, agrar the transformation of, from an agrarian um, uh, farming culture to an industrialized culture and the imposition of time discipline. Um, <clears throat> so uh, example in one of those uh, slow living books um, is the a clock was introduced into the public square in Cologne in the 1370s and it only took 28 years before the city authorities had decided to introduce a public curfew, uh, a curfew by uh, 11 p.m. So um, uh, imaginably before that, um, no one would, could tell you that you had to be home in bed by 11 p.m. because no one knew what time it was. And it's hard to think of alternative conceptions of time, but E.P. Thompson uh, provides lots of great examples. Uh, Pre-industrialized societies used things like the cattle clock. Um, to, you know, the day was organized around tasks. So this is before the division of labor into um, quantifiable com um, uh, uh, chunks. Um, if you had a job to do, you completed the task. This is before the production line. Um, so uh, the cattle clock is like the cows need milking. You milk the cows, you're done. Um, and the conflicts that emerged uh, is, is really the subject of this essay between um, efforts to standardize the measurement of time in the 18th and 19th century and the long-standing agrarian and seafaring task-based systems that were practiced uh, in response to things like the tides, you know, fish during certain tides, uh, the passage of the sun, you know, you go to bed when it's dark, you wake up when the sun comes up. Um, and then there were ways of measuring the duration of things, which are much more subjective than we're used to. So um, uh, in 17th century Chile, um, uh, um, the cooking of an egg could be judged uh, by um, an Ave Maria said aloud. In Burma, in Burma the uh, monks rose at daybreak when there's enough light, quote, uh, to see the veins in the hand. And then there were things like, um, you know, if someone said, how long did it take you? They wouldn't say, oh, about five minutes. They'd say, um, while. While was the word. So you'd say, uh, a paternoster while. So how long it, it took to say a particular prayer. Um, or uh, um, less sacred pissing while. So how long it took you to have a pee. Um, so um, very subjective sense of, of how long things took. So following the um, widespread standardization of time came um, uh, the innovation of scientific management. Um, so we're sort of jumping forward now uh, from E.P. Thompson to uh, total industrialization, um, the arrival of the assembly line, uh, the appearance of Frederick Winslow Taylor, Winslow Taylor in 1895 at the Bethlehem Steelworks in Pennsylvania, um, where he introduces this method of um, making stopwatch observations of people working on the assembly line um, and uh, working out how workers could eliminate waste and perfect motion. So they're, in other words, uh, a vision of people being as efficient as the cogs in the machine um, or the, uh, the rolling conveyor belt. So um, Taylor and his crew would observe how people were working on the assembly line and then um, look for uh, measuring it and how long it took and then how to remove inefficiencies. So um, he said, in the past, man has been uh, put first. In the future, the system will be first. It's kind of scary. 
And the influence of Taylorism at the Ford uh, Model T plant in Michigan became evident in the division of labor. So you know, it was quickly realized if you have the same person doing the same thing over and over again, they'll do it quicker. If they have to complete the task, it takes longer, and time is money. So this is where that phrase comes from, time is money. Um, and so uh, where formerly you'd have skilled laborers uh, exercising substantial control over their conditions of work, now they're reassigned to less skilled, repetitive tasks, minutely specified um, by, by management, increasing the potential for heightened corporate control over the pace and intensity of work. And that's uh, a paraphrase of Gramsci's uh, criticism of, of the assembly line and, and the early stages of, of industrial capitalism. Um, when Siegfried Gideon writes about um, uh, machines, uh, he, he calls in Charlie Chaplin, whose amazingly brilliant film of 1936, Modern Times, um, uh, is, is a sort of very witty critique of, of what I've just described. Um, Chaplin's character performs the same motion eight hours a day uh, until he kind of gets delirious and the uh, world is transformed into uh, nuts that he has to turn with his wrench. Um, and uh, he has to, even tries to go to the bathroom at one point and the uh, foreman appears on a giant screen um, while he's uh, trying to have a sneaky cigarette in the, uh, in the washroom. Um, and so Chaplin highlights the social effects of the assembly line, the separation of the worker from the product of his labors, an authoritarian structure, the foreman on the screen in the washroom, um, that creates friction and competition between workers uh, rather than the solidarity of the, uh, of the workers' guilds um, that were then displaced by mass production, and a surveillance system that ensures uh, worker time is scientifically managed to ensure maximum productivity. And then um, the impact of this system was dramatic and quite insidious. So uh, whereas pre-industrial labor mixed work and play uh, somewhat indiscriminately, um, uh, industrialized labor required that you're punctual. And machines started to set the pace at which people worked. And time became a commodity that could be saved or, or wasted uh, or spent. So it, it's hard to imagine I mean, those phrases, oh, you're wasting time, uh, you need to save time. It's hard to imagine that there was a time when those phrases weren't seen as normal, but um, uh, it's, it's quite uh, pleasant to imagine a time when you couldn't actually waste time. And um, Gideon uh, makes, uh, draws a trajectory linking scientific management with uh, uh, Murray's photographic gun and Moybridge's studies of animals and humans in motion. Uh, symptomatic of a history that takes functionalism as its central tenet. And the um, aesthetics of motion are coupled with the scientific developments in capturing motion under the umbrella of mechanization as progress. And uh, one critic of this, this sort of uh, underlying belief system is uh, Tony Fry, who's argued that the functionalist imperative reduces everything, uh, the question of why something exists, instead to a question of how it, how it functions. So functionalism is only interested in how things work. And that might be uh, why the quantified self people struggle uh, with their insights to get beyond um, uh, other uh, sort of how it works, like how causes the technology, how it tracks, uh, and instead of, they don't ask the why is it tracking. So to jump slightly to a related discipline, anthropometrics and ergonomics um, uh, is, is, is quite easily done when you just uh, link the assembly line and scientific management uh, to uh, the measurement of the body and, um, <clears throat> and think about how this has impacted um, design as it's developed, but also um, its, its role in design history, measurement and design history. Uh, these two terms are very relevant to uh, all design disciplines. Um, anthropometrics, the comparative study of human body measurements and properties, and ergonomics, the science of making the work environment safer and more comfortable for workers uh, using design and anthropometric data. Um, so these areas of study are central to professional design practice in that designers are commonly tasked with making things and environments 
from graphics to signs to user interfaces to interiors to offices, um, hospitals, kitchens, easier to use and suitable for repetitive activity. Um, so perhaps we uh, now see repetitive strain injury in a different light after imagining Charlie Chaplin with his uh, wrench turning, phantom wrench turning. But um, again, to go back, uh, um, as Foucault inspires us to do, uh, to the, uh, the origins, or the, not the origins, but the sort of trajectory that um, precedes the invention of a thing, um, anthropometry's origins or beginnings are in criminology. So there was a French police officer and researcher, Alphonse Petillon, um, who started measuring and classifying physical features um, uh, of, of people who were being convicted of crimes, and that preceded uh, fingerprinting. So um, there was a whole uh, 19th century preoccupation with statistics on crime and suicide, uh, which actually brings us to the early days of data visualization. Uh, Gary's 1832 moral statistics established this practice of mapping or gra uh, graphically representing the distribution of crime and suicide across a region. And Gary got a, a prize, a special prize uh, for his publication of statistics in 1864, um, uh, not for the statistics, but for the graphical representation of those statistics. Um, anyway, he was interested in comparatively measuring suicide rates in France and England, um, but also uh, it was driven a little bit by um, the desire to move suicide from being a crime to being an illness. Uh, and that was partly to do with the professionalism, professionalization of uh, doctors and physicians. Um, so uh, by making suicide an illness rather than a crime, they moved it out of the jurisdiction of the, of the, um, of the police. Um, so uh, this is the beginning of the idea that suicide was a form of madness uh, and hence disease because uh, diseases were thought to be associated with specific organs. So it was a, a disease of the brain. Um, and um, there was also an emerging belief that there were such things as statistical laws as reliable as Newton's laws of gravity. Um, so the collection of data on the population of a state uh, is, is, emerges from around this time, or actually the preceding century, late 18th century, as a means of empowering a state's negotiating powers and the means of exploiting a state. So here's a, an image of um, the uh, down survey of Ireland, which England did, in order to basically take control of all the Catholic-owned areas and give them to um, uh, its, uh, its people. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's also known as the Rape of Ireland. It's a pretty um, shocking incident where mapping was used entirely to exploit a people. Um, Goethe wrote in 1788, by statistical is meant in Germany an inquiry for the purpose of ascertaining the political strength of a country or questions concerning matters of state. So statistics connected to states. So it's the, about state formation. If you uh, for work out how many people are in your country, you have more negotiating power as a state. And data then were, have always been collected for a purpose. Uh, the collection of data on suicide came according to Ian Hacking, who has written about this uh, uh, extensively, um, from the French fascination with deviants, especially those who were considered degenerate or couldn't uh, contribute to the growth of the population. The more people you have, the bigger your state, the more powerful you are. Um, and then there's English-French rivalry. Um, it was considered that English weather was so terrible it produced more suicides because people were miserable all the time. Um, and people, you know, tried to back that up um, with statistics. So uh, <clears throat> back to um, Batillon then. So he's starting to uh, collect data on criminals and crime and starting to measure uh, criminals' head shapes and invents this uh, science of uh, anthropometry. And then arrives a new Italian criminologist, Cesare Lombroso, who begins theorizing, uh, based on this, uh, what Hacking calls avalanche of data, that the criminality is actually inherited and can be identified in advance of the crime. So you see this sort of slippery slope from collecting data and measuring things 
to predicting things based on that data. It's like it seems like a you know natural jump, but it's hugely problematic. And um, to identify defects uh, with such certainty uh, requires a pre-existing sense of what is normal, uh, which in the 19th century has a very specific uh, cultural history. And Hacking again talks about this. Um, so first is this collecting, a, a state collects statistics, this avalanche of printed numbers, um, and then uh, emerges the history, in the history of probability, a very audacious move by this guy, Kittelet, French astronomer, who starts to link statistical observations to probability. So um, he likes the shape of this bell curve. And the bell curve first comes about from measurement of stars. So you uh, measure the position of a star by having lots of different measurements at different times, different people, and you plot where they're happening, and you work out pretty much accurately where the star is based on where the, um, the, the measurements kind of form a bell curve. And then he started to translate or propose that since there were statistical laws, those laws could then be applied to people. So just as the measurements of an astronomical body gave us an accurate position, so too could the measurements of a range of people give us an accurate measure of the average man. And he had a data source. Uh, a Scottish regiment had been measuring the, the uh, uh, girth of the soldiers' chests had amassed an avalanche of data on the uh, size of soldiers' chests, and um, plotting that data arrived, uh, Kittelet arrived at the same bell curve and decided then there must be an average man. So Western science is now marching in tune with and fueling a larger political project that not only identifies normal bodies, it ranks bodies in a hierarchy. And in the 19th century, um, we're in the midst of what the historian uh, Michael Adas calls the civilizing mission. And it's well underway with the European nations voraciously colonizing lands uh, in African, South American, Asian, and uh, Australia uh, continents, uh, hiding brutal exploitation under the guise of humanitarian motives or uh, Christianizing uh, these uh, other, um, the other. Uh, many 19th century writers at the time equated the imperialist projects of Europe with the triumph of science and reason over the forces of superstition and ignorance, uh, which they perceived to be rampant in the non-industrialized world. And particularly prone to adaptation was the theory of evolution, which you know, then was fairly new, um, but it suggested to many writers there was actually a rating system for the gradations between savage and civilized cultures which was visible, they argued, in the degree to which they uh, managed to harness nature. And um, recalling that earlier point about the measurement of time, the European explorers and missionaries who went out to Christianize Africa and Asia found the pace of life exasperating. Um, Africans marked the passage of time only by the cycle of the wet and dry seasons or the transitions from day and night, pretty much like pre-industrialized um, Europe. Um, and the waxing and waning of the moon. And this uh, sort of exasperated the explorers. Um, uh, these sorts of people, uh, David Livingston, who when I was growing up at primary school, we were told these were heroes, um, uh, were, were saying quite appalling things. Um, because Africans had no developed writing system, Europeans assumed they had no history because it hadn't been written down. Um, Edmund Ferry, one of the explorers, claimed that the peoples of the Sudan had no verb forms to express the past tense. Uh, H.L. Duff, another one, compared Africans to intelligent animals because of their presentist orientation. David Livingston, um, who I said was uh, you know, sold as a hero um, and a missionary, uh, reports of a Portuguese peddler in Africa who has to pay a heavy fine to a local chief who had been frightened by his clocks and denounced them as evil products of witchcraft. And here I am, you know, suggesting maybe that clocks aren't uh, as great as we think. So back then, I'd have been considered um, um, <laughs> a savage. So Ada, Ada sums up the attitude to uh, the so-called primitive colonized cultures. He says, textbooks used in colonial schools urged native school children to reject the slothful ways of their ancestors and embrace the work ethic of their conquerors. 
And the most pernicious and dominant of these um, adaptations was the idea of recapitulation. This, which I mentioned earlier, is the idea that the most evolved species supposedly went through the stages of development of the rest of the animal kingdom. And Stephen Jay Gould provides a very good account of Lombroso, um, who thought he discovered anatomical similarities in criminals that record an apish past. Um, so <clears throat> criminals, he argued, are evolutionary throwbacks identified by the physical signs or stigmata. Uh, thus were explained anatomically the enormous jaws, the high cheekbones, prominent superciliary arches, solitary lines in the palms, extreme size of the orbits, handle-shaped ears uh, found in criminals. Um, so it was all meant to be, uh, you know, marks of a uh, less evolved human. And then um, uh, Lombroso wrote whole a whole treatise on the criminality of animals and those he felt were inferior people, providing observations of non-Europeans um, as his prime examples. He, he picked on the, the Dinka of the Upper Nile uh, with their heavy tattooing and high threshold for pain, as he saw it and what he called uh, their apish stigmata. He regarded tattooing as a sign of innate criminality. And this is an illustration in his uh, treatise. Um, so um, uh, on the arm, uh, Womodella is, I think, man of misfortune. Um, the caption advises that tattoos of shaking hands are found very often in pederasts. Um, and on his penis is tattooed, it enders all. So um, this kind of association of tattooing with degeneracy uh, and an earlier um, uh, rung on the evolutionary ladder. So I know it sounds absurd, ridiculous, overtly racist, um, and yet it was considered normal. It's an unexamined way of thinking that was normal. And though we can laugh and distance ourselves from it in time, it actually had quite a big impact on design history. So we don't have to go far from Lombroso to get to Adolf Loos, who in his um, seminal essay, Ornament and Crime, which you may have, uh, um, I'm sure you have all encountered, because it's kind of part of design history lessons, um, he actually uh, uses the same recapitulation argument um, and argues that tattooing and ornamentation are aligned and they're inferior to unadorned, technologically advanced cultures. And this conspicuous rejection of ornaments that can be traced back to Loos, a Czech art architect, um, <coughs> um, uh, is, is pretty apparent in this essay. He argued that a civilization's progress can be measured by the degree to which it has spurred, spurned ornament. Uh, and as, as you uh, know, uh, Loos's buildings were sort of proto-modernist um, uh, form follows function buildings. Um, they you know they're austere, unornamented. Um, and um, here's a quote from the, uh, the essay. In the womb, the human embryo goes through all phases of development the animal kingdom has passed through. And when a human being is born, his sense impressions are like a newborn dog's. In childhood, he goes through all changes corresponding to the changes in the development of humanity. At two, he sees with the eyes of a Papuan. At four, those with a Germanic tribesman. At six, those of Socrates, eight, those of Voltaire. So there you see it's a pretty straight line, um, <coughs> a, a sort of cultural imperialist history. Um, and uh, not to sort of overstretch the point, but um, <coughs> uh, it's, it's uh, uh, not my point. Um, Christina Cogdall uh, describes the recapitulation position as the often unchallenged conservative bedrock beneath the waves of much modernist radicalism. The ornament, tattooing is crime. It's, it's, it's uh, from less evolved cultures. Um, and uh, it's, it, it pervaded the organizational structure of world's fairs. It bolstered colonialist aspirations and seemingly justified military and missionary action. It informed Sigmund Freud's structuring of the unconscious mind. Um, and it shaped anthropologists' perceptions of primitive peoples they studied, and it seemingly dictated the qualities necessary for a civilized and modern architecture. And it doesn't take long, much of a leap to jump to uh, eugenics, the idea that humans could be designed to breed out ugliness, genetic deficiency, and disease, 
um, and uh, uh, the, the sort of Nazi ideas of, um, of biotechnology, um, compulsory practices of immigration, sterilization, and euthanasia in 30s Nazi Germany. Um, and it's not just Germany. There were models um, that were very similar in the US. The Supreme Court upheld a law in 1927 on the compulsory sterilization of what were then called imbeciles. Uh, President Calvin Coolidge in 1921 argued against uh, mixed race marriages. Um, he argued that divergent people will not mix or blend. Um, so um, it's all around us. And then a very famous uh, text, very influential text, um, Edward Said's seminal book, 1978, um, described the ideologies that persisted from Western colonization that supported the project of domination and extraction. Uh, Orientalism, he argued, is anatomical and enumerative. So here we are back to measuring and being. To use its vocabulary is to engage in the particularizing and dividing of everything oriental into manageable parts. Um, so um, there's uh, lots of examples of Orientalism in this uh, book. Uh, one that I'll just use uh, to illustrate it is the British project in India. Um, the uh, colonization of India was characterized um, by the generation of an avalanche of numbers, or what um, Arjun Padurai calls a vast ocean of data, counting and measuring land, fields, crops, forests, castes, tribes, and so on. And so the industrialized West's obsession with counting and measuring everything was deployed in an attempt to control uh, the indigenous population encountered in India. And the goal of the Indian census when it was introduced um, was ostensibly pragmatic to set tax laws, tax levels, resolve land disputes, adjudicate indigenous claims for political representation and so on. But the census, while it appeared to be a passive instrument of knowledge, um, uh, was, was a, a form of social control, of labeling the deviant and the marginal. Um, and uh, of course, it had already been tried out in Britain. So the entire population in India, uh, in a way, was considered marginal because it wasn't you know, British. And um, that kind of raised the stakes for the empire's need to, to govern it by imposing the system. So Apadurai, again, writes, numbers gradually became more importantly part of the illusion of bureaucratic control and a key to a colonial imaginary in which countable abstractions of people and resources at every imaginable level and for every conceivable purpose created the sense of a controllable indigenous reality. So um, <clears throat> back to um, anthropometrics and ergonomics, it's easy to see why by the mid 20th century, ergonomics or human factors presumed that the optimum data for the universal user could be based on an American uh, uh, European Caucasian. Um, Henry Dreyfus's well-known maxisms um, start with the user. This is the principle that underlies every successful product design, he said. Um, uh, uh, prompt the question now, which user is he talking about? Um, his most uh, was his famous line, the point of contact, if the point of contact between the product and the people becomes a point of friction, then the industrial design has failed, um, sort of identifies his indebtedness to streamlining, like sort of frictionless um, uh, product design, um, uh, the abhorrence of ugliness, the embrace of sleek aerodynamic forms, abhorrence of decoration and dirt catching surfaces. And um, uh, we kind of see, uh, or hopefully you can see a sort of connection, a connection now between um, this, of period and the, um, the idea of uh, sort of frictionless ergonomics attached to a particular idea of a particular kind of normal. Um, this phrase I always find very useful. It came out of a post-colonial studies reader, um, Lack of Fit, uh, um, where it's describing a Canadian poet, Dennis Lee, who wrote, uh, the colonial writer does not have words of his own. Um, so, uh, and another quote from him, the language was drenched with our non-belonging. So he's talking specifically about uh, the colonial settlers arriving in Canada, confronted with a landscape 
where the language they had, the English language, didn't work to describe it. So lack of fit between the colonial language and what they encountered. But lack of fit is very useful for also talking about the uh, contradiction between the universal user, as um, the sort of modernist credo would have it, uh, and um, the uh, reality that there is no average person. Um, so uh, this is an anecdote now from my journalistic uh, background. Um, I was writing a, uh, a story about a project uh, called Size China, which is a product, another uh, Canadian product designer um, had encountered a particular issue when he was trying to design snowboarding helmets. Um, so, um, sorry, I showed the wrong image. So what was happening was uh, um, he was working with uh, Burton Snowboards to find out why one of its award-winning products had sold really well in the US and Europe but hadn't sold at all in Japan. And so uh, Burton, with uh, Roger Ball, the designer, um, organized a meeting um, with some celebrated uh, Japanese snowboarders. And um, according to Ball, at uh, the meeting, uh, they, they asked, why aren't our helmets selling in Japan? And the snowboarders said, the Japanese snowboarders said, we can't wear it. We can't wear your helmet. It gives us a splitting headache. Um, and Ball, Roger Ball, the designer, said, why? And they said, we have a different shaped head than you. So Ball did some uh, research and, um, uh, into why people don't fit products. And um, this is sort of a classic question facing any ergonomist. Um, but it's sort of all around us. You know, there's the toilet where you can't fit your knees, um, <laughs> the uncomfortable aircraft seat, or the inability of a chair to support a nap in the office. Um, and uh, Roger Ball discovered that that uh, source of data source that I showed earlier, uh, the measure of man by Henry Dreyfus, um, was actually directly connected to a 1940s survey of US military personnel. So the, the key source of anthropometric data that purports to be universal actually belongs to this era. Uh, the field of ergonomics came out of studies done in America in World War II. And, um, uh, the particular problem at the time was cockpit design, how to design a cockpit of a fighter plane so that it's easy to fly and drop bombs and shoot people um, uh, on your own. And um, Dreyfus Associates were tasked with locating the controls, uh, say the radar, and um, uh, design certain equipment and make it usable. So they had to know um, the size and shape of the military personnel. So anthropometric data was collected um, for that purpose and became the, um, uh, the sort of standard definition. And the, uh, it permitted a fairly limited range of body types. Um, and uh, one of Dreyfus's employees, Alvin Tilly, drew the famous anthropomorphic anthropometric charts of what they called Joe and Josephine, typical Americans. Um, <clears throat> So um, Roger Ball, uh, realizing that the helmets, snowboarding helmets he designed were based on um, a particular uh, demographic, a particular culture, it was data that wasn't neutral, it was from a certain place at a certain time with a certain purpose, uh, got some funding. He moved to Hong Kong for an academic position, got some funding from the Chinese government to embark on a new anthrop anthropometric data set. Um, uh, it was called uh, Size China, and they um, traveled up and down the country with a van and some 3D scanning equipment, uh, basically just scanning people. Um, and um, uh, 2,000 Chinese civilians were scanned. Uh, they're sitting uh, in front of um, the scanner, and um, they end up looking like this, and uh, they arrived at a new uh, data set. Now, I showed that sunglasses image earlier because um, the thing that really uh, in, um, motivated Roger Ball to get funding from the government was he was being interviewed um, by a Hong Kong cosmopolitan journalist uh, who um, was talking to him about how Western sunglasses, who are very popular in Hong Kong, don't fit, uh, um, her, didn't fit her and her friends because they kept sliding off her nose. Um, because uh, 
they're not designed for Asian-shaped noses. And so she said, some friends and I are thinking of getting plastic surgery so that those sunglasses fit. And um, Roger Ball was appalled that people would redesign their faces to fit the sunglasses rather than redesign the sunglasses. So that uh, inspired him to go do this project. Um, and it's interesting what results from the light. They're kind of creepy, these head shapes, but they're a very useful data set. Um, and um, uh, they, this uh, provided the National Research Council of Canada um, with a, a data set that's uh, used because um, the resolution is way, way higher than the existing anthropometric um, sets, which is called CESAR, the US Air Force Initiated Civilian, American, and European Surface Anthropometry Resource. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I think it's time to bring back Foucault. <laughs> I apologize for my cheesy uh, Monty Python inspired <laughs> PowerPoint tricks. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, one more time. Uh, <laughs> Once we establish statistical norms, it becomes rather too easy for those to become desirable norms or means of controlling bodies. And um, uh, Deborah Lupton cites uh, uh, a 2014 study in which um, human-computer interaction researchers analyzed 52 videos of self-trackers on the Quantified Self website. And the study notes that they were mostly men who worked in the digital technology industry with the largest group monitoring health-related factors such as physical activity, food consumption, weight, and mood. Um, so uh, that there was a specific uh, demographic set doing this kind of quantification of the self. So that data is going to be limited by the, uh, the scope of the measurements. Um, and then um, she also uh, brings in Foucault to start to interrogate the unexamined ways of thinking behind the quantification of the self and the uh, invention of norms. And so uh, she writes, rather than disciplinary power being exerted on individuals or populations, biopower, which is a sort of internalization of norms, much as I talked about the internalization of time, uh, the internalization of, of nose shapes, uh, the internalization of head shapes. So um, that's uh, what Foucault would call biopower. Um, it's a subtle thing, and it's focused on the promotion of self-regulation and self-management. And that's what she says is at work in the quantification of the self. Mobile digital technologies that measure bodily movement and body functioning and report these data to the device user produce a spectacular body. Um, spectacular meaning, you know, the one that becomes a spectacle, one that is visualized. One in which the internal workings are similarly displayed and made visible. And I thought this is a good image to show Fritz Kahn's kind of mechanical man as industrial palace from um, uh, the 1920s, um, because in a sense, that sort of modernist legacy is still with us in the version of the quantified self that's always been measured and spectacularized. It's published on the websites and then shared. So our internal uh, workings are made transparent, visible. And the um, the hype of the quantified self suggests a digital virtual body that somehow transcends our fleshly selves. So a quote um, from the website, as we get more and more connected, our feeling of being tied into one body will also fade as we become data creatures, bodiless, angelized. So they get quite uh, poetic about the idea that somehow measuring yourself and datafying yourself removes you from your fleshy self. Um, you, you sort of surpass it. Um, <clears throat> so um, the uh, spectacular body in which the internal workings are displayed and made visible uh, is sort of underlying uh, visualization. But what is the effect of these tools that spectacularize our bodies? One interesting study on the QS website is from Caton Williams. He was a PhD candidate at Cornell. Um, and he started tracking himself and um, managing himself by proxy, as was discussed earlier. And the feedback from his digital model, which he was constructing, um, he noticed it started to take precedence over how he physically felt. Uh, so it was a kind of um, subtle, uh, and doesn't explore it much, but it's a sort of hint of what uh, the psychoanalyst was calling earlier the subcontracting of the monitoring process. 
Um, and Louisa Moore, who writes a lot on security, a uh, geographer, um, starts talking about the biometric border, a concept introduced by uh, US contractors Accenture in response to the war on terror, um, which was a sort of $10 billion restructuring of port security, air, land, and seaports, um, based on the concept of the virtual or biometric border. So instead of the border that you enter when you get off the plane, think of the biometric border as something that sort of knows you're on your way um, to the country. Um, it reaches beyond physical borders to assess security risks before you get there. And I don't know for sure, but I suspect the whole uh, ETA, ESTA thing is related to this time. Um, because uh, before um, this time, this restructuring, um, to go to the States didn't require that I um, got this special clearance, the ESTA clearance, same as coming here. Now it's required. So I'm, I suspect that the, that's a, a, a manifestation of the biometric border. Um, the management of the border cannot be understood simply as a matter of the geopolitical policing and discipline of the movements of bodies across mapped space, uh, writes Amor. Rather, it's more appropriately understood as a matter of biopolitics, a mobile regulatory site through which people's everyday lives can be made amenable to intervention and management. So, um, in closing, uh, a few questions, a few things to pose, and maybe a, a, a sort of... Um, uh, a reason for hope. <laughs> um, is the quantified self perpetuating the production of a particular kind of biopolitics, the self that's amenable to intervention and management by the state? Um, that's a question. How might the biopolitical production of ourselves be challenged? How might we subvert it? Um, and is it all bad? the quantification of ourselves, the measuring, this sort of narcissism of, of counting, measuring, and making public ourselves. Uh, so a few examples then in closing of um, a more poetic, uh, creative, um, artistic projects. Uh, there's Alberto Frigo's life stowing experiments gone on for 36 years. Um, uh, he records the details of his dreams, the songs he listens to, the s external surroundings in which he moves each day, the people he meets, new ideas, cloud shapes, daily weather. It's kind of a nice, um, you know, it's like a journal, really. So in the serial documentation of one's daily activity, uh, is there something actually quite life-affirming going on that goes beyond quantification, measurement, reinforcing um, uh, status quo? Can it be understood um, in other terms? And I think a good place to look is, uh, or the place that came to mind, was the post-war art and literature movements that took as their subject the everyday and the self. So we go back to um, Georges Perec and the Ulupo movement. Um, <clears throat> Perec was uh, embracing the mapping of the mundane. Um, he said things like, you must set about it slowly, almost stupidly. Force yourself to write down what is of no interest, what is most obvious, most common, most colorless. Um, so his prose is, um, is sort of very uh, refined and uh, sort of exquisite descriptions of very mundane things. And he famously, or the Ulipo group famously set themselves... Um, uh, constraints, like the writing a whole novel without the letter E. But that sounds like a uh, formal exercise, but it um, actually belongs in a social uh, political context. Um, it doesn't take much digging to notice that um, the French name of this novel, which in English is translated as The Void, is La Disparition, which suggests uh, the disappearance of something. So obviously it's the letter E, but um, Perec's uh, family um, did, were disappeared. They were deported to concentration camps. And he kept uh, uh, in his desk uh, the certificate of his mother's disappearance, which was uh, issued by the Ministry of War Veterans. And um, the title on that certificate was Act de Disparition. So the title um, obviously had uh, a connection for him. And um, in the novel, characters, when they're about to use a word, that contains the letter E, they just disappear. So um, what we think of as a playful, formalist exercise 
um, has uh, an interesting social context with quite a profound meaning. And then there's uh, Onkawara. Um, he sent out these daily postcards, um, uh, people he met, places he visited, books he read. Over an 11-year period, he sent a postcard every day to uh, friends and colleagues, and it included the time he woke up, his geographical location, uh, a painting, a newspaper cutting. And then, um, inspired by Kawara, uh, Alfredo Jar, um, who um, made his Signs of Life postcard project after he visited Rwanda. Um, so uh, the Rwandan genocide, um, if you don't know, uh, happened in April 1994, uh, continued for 100 days, uh, started in April 1994, and uh, resulted in the deaths of a million people, a million Rwandans. Um, and Alfredo Jar went to Rwanda that same year as the genocide um, and called it the most horrific experience of his life. But it was to bear witness to um, what was considered one of the greatest failures of humanity in the 20th century. And um, his postcard project was a life-affirming response. So where uh, people had survived, he would send out a postcard with their name and is still alive. Uh, again, like Kawara, to friends um, and family. So the postcard project is at once a dirge and an exaltation, as um, one art critic calls it. And um, it's a very life-affirming project. And so to close, uh, none other than Henri Lefebvre, who was a big fan of the everyday, uh, saw it as a, a kind of a place uh, everydayness is where we actually start our resistance to the uh, forces that seek to always homogenize life. Um, and it is in everyday life, he says, and starting from everyday life, that genuine creations are achieved. Those creations which produce the human and which men produce as part of the process of becoming human works of creativity. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. That was awesome. Um, I have a few questions, but uh, they're more like just to get the ball rolling. If anybody has a burning question, please let me know. Anybody? OK. Pardon me? Yeah? You can absolutely. Um. Hi, thank you for that. You, uh, one of the questions you asked about us was that whether it's all bad to be quantifying ourselves and measuring everything and, and, and presenting it to everyone else. But the other thing that I have been thinking about, you know, a few years now and more in the last year, and, and because of what you've been saying as well, is these cultures of sharing that we have in social media and, and, and in so many other related spaces now. Uh, there are also cultures of voyeurism, hmm. and that's a whole different angle. But then I also feel like there are uh, spaces where I think people have felt they can share in ways that have empowered others to feel it's okay to be certain ways. And so there's good and bad in everything. Yeah, but the, yeah. the voyeuristic aspect is something that I have felt more recently and, and feel like there's no control in the way we build applications that we are all using don't necessarily give us control over that. And you make sometimes have to make strange decisions about who you are no longer following or being friends with. And you know, it's kind of, it's not quite right somehow, yeah. some of it. Yeah. Just to come back. No, that's really a good point. That it's, um, it's not all bad, it's not all good, um, but it's definitely changing us, right? Yeah. It's funny, I was sort of thinking along those lines as well, you know, how, how to, your comment that, um, you know, that your, your question, is this kind of, uh, these practices of the quantified self, are they necessarily always negative? And sort of on one hand, I'm thinking, as, as you said that, I'm thinking of your first examples, which were um, 
you know, the gathering um, or the archiving of personal information via tech, you know, apps, right? Um, to, to measure your mood or to, to chart your um, daily activities. I feel there's a real qualitative difference between that and the examples you showed later, you know, mm -hmm. the Alfredo jar and, and so on. Um, and it strikes me it's around the question of control. Uh, and I don't mean that in a kind of a, a larger kind of state kind of control sense, but rather control of um, these as personal artifacts, personal, uh, you know, control of your creative resources. Yeah. You know, like I see this, this kind of um, uh, keeping track of your activities, it's, it's, uh, it, it can be an act of love, right? You know, caring for yourself or caring for someone, tracking something, you know, new mothers track how often they feed their babies because they're terrified that their baby will starve to death in the two hours that they're not being fed, right? Teenage girls, I mean, I can like speak from a feminine perspective, teenage girls chart a lot of things to kind of find their way in the world, you know? Um, I think we, we track our way through new experiences or experiences we think are really profound or beautiful, but we control mm. those as creative resources. <laughs> Like, whereas if it's being collected by an app, I'm not, I'm not sure what my relationship to it is, and it, it makes me uncomfortable. Like, I don't see the creativity of it yeah, quite another, as much. Another example is the way illness, like if you're ill, um, it can really, uh, like if you have a serious illness, it can really help to keep a, a calendar um, of your symptoms, the medications you're taking, and the impact of this, so you start to see patterns. But if someone suggests that we need an app for that, I'd be like, oh, oh please. Um, and I think it might, I think it's connected to this, um, uh, sort of this, the agendas of the tools that we create. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like the same with the uh, voyeurism issue. Well, can I just make a, I just want to just connect between how we are all using, as you were just saying, like there's so many ways that we use all these like I use Instagram in a very personal, it, it, is a, it is a tracking of my life, but I'm very careful of who I allow on it. But at the same time, it's still, that app is not really giving me a variety of ways to control that. And yeah. they're not acknowledging that, yes, it's a creative space, it's a personal space, it's an intimate space, and they're designed for different reasons, but we as humans are starting to use them so differently um, for different reasons, whether you're ill or whether you're up on my question it just felt that there were two things here that were being told right so one is the medium because you were making a comparison between the difference of notes taking against an app for the same for the same thing for the same illness or from the same babe feeding right so 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 that is one issue right that eventually goes back to your beginning of the tools of of, of Macruland, right in terms of um us creating tools and the tools shaping us and you know the feedback I, I would rather call it a feedback loop right that actually yeah. keeps us moving rather than you know this kind of causal effect um, but um, that's my view of it um, and the second thing is the purpose for which we are doing right which I think has to do with the wire is more the control or or the um, the care or whatever that is and and I think they are distinct I, I would Put them distinct, but I would love to hear your 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 views because um, yeah. Do you think the um, the voyeurism is a result of the um, of the agenda of the 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 tool? Like it, I guess so. Say Facebook emerges out of, as a social media tool and a university campus at a, uh, to serve the needs of students who. Uh, constantly interested in what their peers are doing and yeah I, I i will let her speak for voyeurism but from my understanding of voyeurism is the the side of the need to to be seen right so mm -hmm. so i mean so we 
it, it, it is, there is a double road there, so I think Benjamin involved a little bit about, which, which necessitates the need to be, to be viewed. And, 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 and so, so you have that, again, that kind of uh, double way road to mention the title of the book, but uh, yeah, but I don't know the deep wires, no, but I'm not familiar with the literature. What are your reasons for your reason for your reason? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any reason for yeah, it. Yeah, it's like yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and I, I'm also interested in that critique of social media, uh, the filter bubble critique, um, you know, which sort of is related to voyeurism, right? Because you know that a certain group of people are always looking or there's a perception there's a group of people watching what you're doing so you act according to that projected sense of your observers and then it's easy to be suspicious and say it's a yes. you know yeah. and then then it can kind of the sub, the, sub, the, the the first part of the wire is eventually oh sorry i should not move my hands right now <laughs> is eventually the control of it so it's back to your point right so yeah and i think that's probably Amor's point also with the biopower, that um, the <laughs> best control is the internalized voluntary control, the sort of post-panopticon uh, control of oneself. And, and I pretty much think that those things, and I mean, I, I thought actually you're going to go there uh, when you're bringing the normalization, the criminalization and all that. And I think there is somehow somewhat of a connector there yeah. and I think the connecting point perhaps is why you're using uh, me to, to you know I, I don't yeah. because you know there is also that understanding when we read articles about you know people who who go into controlling positions right of uh, militaries and so on so there is that side as well right um, but again it's like Thanks for the great talk, Peter. Um, I have ideas I'm trying to formulate into a question here. I guess I, uh, in talking about sort of standardization of time and authoritarian power, um, I was also curious, you mentioned language a little bit when you were talking about lack of fit, but I'm curious your thoughts about how language is used in the measurement of time, whether that's like cultural differences, because I was thinking about that in mapping. You know, there are indigenous tribes that you don't use left and right, they use north, northwest. Um, and I, so I wonder if that applies to words around time and the measurement of time, and if that changes sort of those cultural perceptions of, of the measuring aspect. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh that's what's so great about that E.P. Thompson essay is it attracts the changing of the language from, um, you know, uh, paternoster while and pissing while to um, time is money. Uh, so, uh, you know, complete transformation of the language uh, to support the enforcement of uh, an ideology uh, that's a controlling one. And then the, the um, Michael Ada's account of of exasperated missionaries arriving in countries where there wasn't the same language around um, uh, the clock, this device, you know, it didn't order their lives. Uh, so, um, but oh, that, your question makes me think, you know, where is that conflict now? You know, is that, is it still being um, challenged? So God, I don't know. I mean, I can only think of generational examples. I used to annoy my dad because he was a commuter. He commuted all his life, and I'd say things like, I don't need a watch to waste my time. And it was like a um, you know, kind of snippy teenager. And there must be those sorts of generational. Yeah. For me, what 
became abundantly clear as you went through your, um, your presentation was that the colonial project is not over, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's like we've inherited this logic of separation, of quantification, of reification, making, reducing things all the time, and that it grapples onto a lot of very human, very healthy um, activities, like, like reflecting, like uh, leaving an inscription, um, passing on knowledge, um, self-care, that these things through this other lens, not other, it's you know, something that I inherited, so it's part of me, but it's this constant push to constantly separate, constant, so you, you Jan, your, your comment about like, um, once it goes to the cloud, who has it, mm. right? Mm. So there's this constant refrain of extraction, of pulling away, of um, repurposing for analysis, for control, for monetization, for everything else. So it's not a comment, but it seems, it, but it, I, it, it's more of a reflection on what you've been. Uh, yeah, that's really it. useful, uh, phrasing it like that too, because it makes me realize with the Lefebvre quote on the screen, that's not enough, is it? You can't just celebrate the everyday. You have to celebrate and uh, restore uh, the knowledges that aren't um, uh, extracted or haven't yet to be extracted, you know, that all can't be extracted, like the, the knowledges that um, uh, are smaller and not homogenized. Yeah. So everyday life isn't enough on its own. It's not an individual thing. It's a, um, a connecting thing. One of the distinctions that Lefebvre makes, especially around uh, creativity and, and, uh, and capitalism, is he distinguishes between works and products, right? And so it's no mistake that he's talking there about works of mm -hmm. creativity, right? Which um, I, I think he he writes, especially in the production of space, he talks about how this this is always a revolutionary uh, thing. You know, it's always, uh, all creativity works always come out of this um, revolutionary impulse, this unpredictability, right? Whereas products are met, uh, products are exactly what they sound like. They're measurable. They're predictable, you know, and you know they're very uh, um, consistent, which is how they can become commodities, right? Um, so, I, I liked your bringing up E.P. Thompson here, um, uh, because so, so so just to step back, so there's kind of like especially in Lefebvre this distinction between works of art and products of machine uh, a machine uh, society, right? Of capitalism. And you know, one of the things that E.P. Thompson talks about is how workers really resisted. I mean, we even go back, you know, like you were describing how, um, you know, sort of feudal time, you know, where time was organized by day and by night, and you know, nobody told you what to do and stuff. But you were very much organized by gender, and and religion was organizing your time, and you know, so there was, you know, uh, these festivals that were created as a way to sort of allow people to express their, you know, refusal to conform, right? Um, and E.P. Thompson writes about um, how, you know, the introduction of, of kind of machine time and this sort of uh, organization of, of uh, the day to accommodate labor was really profoundly resisted by the mm. workers. They, mm. did n they did not go along. Um, there was, you know, violence in the workplace, and what was it called? Blue was it Blue Monday, where so workers would show up completely drunk from the leftover yeah, yeah, from yeah. the weekend yeah. because they did not acknowledge Monday as a work day. Right? They did not acknowledge that they had to come to work on Monday morning because they hadn't actually finished with their weekend. Right? So, and and you know, machines were broken. A lot of broke machines and so. On. In your kind of uh, survey, are people resisting? Like, are people resisting apps? Are, are, you know, like, are we, I know I am to a small degree, but I also know it's really hard to resist. Like, 
I'm not on Facebook, but I know I'm being captured in ways that I'm not savvy enough yeah. to perceive. Like, is there resistance? Where is the resistance? I mean, this um, uh, There's there was a project called uh, is it by Michael Wolf called Street View Fuck You, um, <laughs> where uh, he um, found those points in Google Street View where people are just giving the finger to the Street View cars that's going by, and uh, it's very and then yeah yeah yeah. And they're very nicely. Um, actually, I think this is uh, from him too. They, uh, but all the FUs have been counted. <laughs> right. right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, a double edged sword. Um, and this is not that same project, but uh, it's the same artist where he's like zooming in on um, details where, yeah, people are, appear to be completely tracked or overladen with uh, motifs. Um, I think a really good, that's a question for uh, everyone here. Like, what resistance to apps is there? There's a book called Obfuscation, or Data Obfuscation, I think. Uh, I think it's by MIT Press. I could be wrong. Uh, and it came out a few years ago on these different um, techniques or uh, urges to, um, to either uh, resist tracking or to um, introduce noise into the channel so that um, you can hide in plain view. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's one thing. I can't enumerate all the different strategies there, but uh, that was a compilation of that. I mean, I've noticed like every time there's been a scandal around what Facebook's doing with knowledge, people are using it less and less on personal things, like posting less of their personal lives and more just articles and news and views. I feel like that's happening a lot. And I think there's been a trend of people trying to pose, post less, at least on Facebook, but that doesn't mean that they're not using other channels like chat, Snapchat and Instagram and et cetera, all of which have some of the same rules about who owns what at the end of the day. So then that question of, but I don't know, I mean, you were just talking about creative works and products, but I don't, I don't know if there's a difference anymore in the way that the privacy agreement calls our creative works their products, and if in some day all of this ends up as products. Right. So yeah. we, we, you know, we don't seem to have an upper hand other than to just completely disengage. And that too, because of the law that you can't delete all your past uh, Facebook records, for example, like I was like thinking this time, oh yeah, well, I'm going to delete the whole thing, you know, since this is now going downhill. But the thing is, they already have all my data. Uh, the, uh, we, we don't have that um, right to delete in Canada. They do in Europe, I believe. So um, so the question is, yeah, what's the product? What's it, and when, when do we get control and will we get control? Well, I just thought of um, a Dutch book called Society Society of the Query, which is about a search engine um, culture. And uh, it, there's one essay in there that's about alternative search engines that don't uh, record all your searches and your data, like um, DuckDuckGo, I think, is one. And, uh, I have a quick comment about um, colonialism. So I think earlier this year, there was a lot of backlash against IBM's facial recognition because it was racist. Um, so it couldn't recognize, I think it had a very poor rate of recognition when the skin was darker and especially for females. And then basically this Guangzhou-based company that does facial recognition just signed a deal with Zimbabwe to actually improve their algorithms to better recognize uh, people of darker skin color, and I think it's an interesting question when you have technology that's actually racist in a way it protects potentially mm. in some way. I mean, it's obviously problematic, but I, I find it interesting maybe where you are protected when technology doesn't recognize you. I don't know, something to think about. Thanks for that. Yeah. And I also um, was curious about sort of like the next stage of measuring, which is like our DNA measurement. Like we're all using the ancestry.ca, like this quantification of our 
heritage and ancestry, which is also hugely problematic for privacy reasons. For, but I, I uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts what happens, on. What's the uh, controversy? Is it because you don't, when your uh, DNA is sort of analyzed, you don't have that? analysis it also belongs to the company that does the analysis. yes yes and then depending you know it's different everywhere but recently they caught a serial killer from the 70s in the united states based on a relative of his who'd used an ancestry kit um dna swabbing kit um but then it also um gives you percentages of your heritage but it's very hard to track and and but it's this other level of self measurement uh, quantification, yeah. Yeah, that's also interesting that one, uh, given the, um, I mean, I'm thinking about this in light of Brexit and uh, uh, everyone, it seems, in the UK is now talking about, well, do you have any Irish heritage? Oh, maybe we can get you citizenship through our <laughs> Irish blood. Um, and, uh, you know, the sort of manipulation of uh, DNA uh, information to sort of serve the interests of um, which state you want to belong to. So uh, I, I, it's like hacking, hacking your genes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting, yeah. They just sold their, their data to Pfizer or some other uh, ah. major uh, drug dealer. Uh, 23andMe, sorry. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, probably didn't see that coming. <laughs> but, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I really, uh, I actually just finished research on the logistics of citizenship in the biometric border. So I really appreciated your bringing up Louise Amour. Um, and I also really appreciated the genealogy of biometrics that you highlighted today. But I am also curious about um, what you might, uh, I don't know, uh, contribute to thinking about the ethical responsibilities of data visualization and bio art. And bio art, did you say? Yeah, just uh, because of my research, I've been kind of exploring some of the things that are happening in contemporary art, and especially something sort of you've talked about at the ancestry, like. Um, there's artists collecting people's waste and kind of almost cloning people into like reproducing an identity. Um, and I see that as being very problematic, but it's like how do, you know, artists and even like designers like produce data that doesn't contribute to this genealogy of biometrics and biopolitics and eugenic kind of archiving? Yeah, I, I think I don't know. I can answer specifically on bio art um, and data visualization and more because um, I think about this issue of um, ethics versus morals quite a lot um, because maybe because I'm attached to an undergraduate course and you feel a little bit, I feel a little bit obliged to um, raise this question of, uh, you know, what about ethics? Because, you know, I don't believe you can. Uh, learn a professional or practice without also learning its ethical implications. Um, but the problem is, uh, I think, and I think it's partly connected to that whole, uh, you know, the sort of first things first level of discourse that perceives discussions about ethics as a sort of moralizing. And um, Anthony Grayling, the philosopher, has a really nice interview in... Um, uh, Lucien Roberts' book, which is called Good, uh, and he's talking to her about the difference between ethics and morals, and uh, how the sort of Christianizing of ethics since the Greeks resulted in a kind of moral thou shalt not, and lost the exploratory nature of an ethical inquiry, where, um, where Socrates' point was um, the examined life, right? Which I actually took out Socrates' slides because I thought um, this is going on way too long already. Uh, but the, to contrast the ethical project of Socrates of the examined life, because he famously said at his trial, the unexamined life is not worth living. Therefore, I shall die. Because he was, he was given the choice of dying or giving up philosophy, I think, was his uh, 
trial. Um, so the unexamined life is not worth living. And that's become the sort of such an interesting question. And are the quantified selfers actually analyzing their own lives? Um, uh, but um, I think that contrast that Grayling comes up with between ethics and morals is very useful uh, and possibly useful for artists um, who prefer not to address uh, the moral issues of what they're doing. But if they were to think of everything they do as part of their ethical constitution, then perhaps there's an invitation to consider consequences more. And I do think that whole Foucauldian line of uh, questioning is also about ethics. Because you, if you're looking at the unexamined ways of thinking, you are thinking about them ethically. Uh, so yeah, I, I think um, it's time for a, a revival of ethics. Well, um, bolstering, acceleration, amplification. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm wondering in terms of the aesthetics of quantification or of data visualization, why is it that in your view, um, they have a very kind of modernist aesthetic. Why is it that kind of echoing uh, Adolf Lewis, they're kind of seen, as, or ornamentation is seen as a crime when it comes to the aesthetics of, of data visualization. Yeah, like the whole rampage. This is a great question. I hadn't thought about the rampage against chart junk in Tufty. Yeah. And, um, uh, but looking around this room, we see quite a lot of things that he might consider, uh, the, through the gallery, he might consider chart junk. Uh, um, but, you know, I, I think are, um, extremely important. And then if you look at uh, J.B. Harley's um, insistence that we look at the borders of maps and the heraldic devices and the little things in the corners, and because they become devices to and clues to understanding the situatedness of a map, where it comes from, when it comes from, and what the interests were and the limits of the knowledge. Uh, so um, I don't know why, but I like the question. I don't know why that sort of modernist hatred of ornamentation has persisted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that probably it's something, not that everything relates to teaching, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the way in which the modernist canon still tends to underlie the teaching of um, visual culture. Everything is at least still positioned in reference to it, even if you're trying to displace it. Can I just add that there is a there's a through line right between this um, pursuit of rational thought of scientific knowledge, of stripping away what isn't necessary, and which is subjective, and so th th their cousins or siblings or more than that mm, yeah. and and they come together in very powerful ways and so it's no mystery that in the quantified self there's a lot of appeals to a scientific authority to something that goes beyond just um whim and that is represented throughout the past century or so in this um simple line right. that is uh, non-negotiable yeah. that is uh, machine made and not by hand, right? So yeah. that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you put your finger on it just now, Patricio, because um, as someone on the design side, but who's worked for and with art stuff a lot, uh, I, c I know I have so much modernist uh, pedagogy and, and, and principles in me that now I'm working to, to get out because there's this universalist stuff that doesn't look right anymore. There's this objectivity stuff that doesn't seem right anymore. And uh, emotion, I'm, in, I'm interested enough in psychology, emotion, the inner world, and those materials now uh, that as a designer, I want to get at them, but without just resorting to self-expression. And um, so I like what you said about subjectivity, objectivity, and 
the stuff inside modernism is also about control. Uh, I think like the, and the presence of the machine, which is what makes me want to be a designer, like replication to provide, let's say its service or its value to many, not few. Mm -hmm. Using machines is a good way to do that. Do st doing stuff by hands is expensive. It's a luxury now, arguably. Um, so I still want to be a designer, but I want to escape that uh, universalist stuff. And that poses all sorts of questions when it comes to teaching, doesn't it? Because you, uh, uh, um, you know, even the term user-friendly, uh, you have to sort of rethink, oh, well, which users am I talking about being friendly with? <laughs> yeah. What kind of friend? I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's really no, because some user-friendly is like um, trying to get you to do more things, right? So the, yes. uh, the variable reward mechanism in social media, very user-friendly because it's engaging, but to, for, with whose priorities in mind? And I was quite in, interested in uh, Philippe uh, yesterday talking about Neurath, Otto Neurath, who I see as a kind of key figure in the sort of modernist approach to visualization. But in Philippe's eyes, he's a very important and useful figure because he's about making complex information accessible to um, you know people who are not even necessarily... Uh, literate and uh yeah it's it's not it's not a you can't just sort of throw it all out you know it's, there's there's useful stuff there well um please join me in thanking uh peter for a great talk <laughs> and thank you for your uh really wonderful comments uh i think this is the uh the last event we have associated with the exhibition. So this exhibition is on for another week and a half, maybe, uh, at the, and it closes on the end, at the end of September for Nuit Blanche. So um, yeah, tell everybody <laughs> that, is, that it's gonna end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, good night. <laughs>